Um, just before we, just before we commence, a uh, couple of notices. First of all, apologies from Deputy Canny, who uh, won't be attending this session. Um, the usual reminder about mobile phones uh, to either switch them off or put them on the flight mode as they interfere not just here in the room but with the recording and broadcast and I need to read the note in relation to privilege for those of you here this afternoon. I wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of section 17.2.1 of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you're directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to so do, you're entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You're directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you're asked to respect the parliamentary practice to that effect. Where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, persons or entity by name in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. Uh, the opening statements submitted to the committee will be published on the committee website after the meeting. And members are reminded of the long-standing practice to the effect that they should not comment on criticise or make charges against a person outside the houses or an official either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. So at this stage of the afternoon um, I'm very pleased to welcome the housing agency here this afternoon represented by uh, Mr John O'Connor, Chief Executive of the Housing Agency, uh, Connor Skehan, uh, the Chairman and Mr David Silk, Director. Uh, you're all very welcome. And um, Mr. Sheehan, Ms. Skihan, I think uh, you're doing the opening statement. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, we'll do that. And uh, just, uh, thank you, just to thank you all uh, for having us here, Cahir Looking members, and to say we have an opening statement and we also submitted a body of material which we thought might be of assistance, which uh, we're obviously not going to read out, but it's available to you in your, consider in your deliberations. So, uh, just to, our opening statement is that we're pleased to be here this afternoon to assist the committee uh, in its examination of the issues facing us in relation to housing and homelessness. Uh, you've been introduced to John O'Connor, our Chief Executive Officer, and uh, David Silk, our Director, who will assist in, uh, in, in answering any questions you may have. The agency was founded in, two, uh, thousand, in, in 2010, and our vision is to enable everyone to live in good quality, affordable homes in sustainable communities. We in the agency provide a wide level of expert advice, support, research and training activities for local authorities, for the Department of Environment, Community and Local Government, for approved housing bodies, for NAMA and many other public and private sector organisations in this pursuit. The many activities that we're involved in, together with our research, provides us, the agency, with a unique vantage point from which uh, to be able to offer this committee uh, with advice and observations on current housing issues in Ireland and how to make progress toward improving them. And again, we've taken what you've asked us to do very seriously in the material that's been handed to you. We've specifically identified a whole series of issues and what we think are solutions towards them for you to consider in your work. Um, we... I suppose just to set out at the beginning to remind everyone, as the Minister did this morning, that uh, housing in Ireland consists of many parts and that successful policies and actions will need to be coordinated across all of the parts. So if we have one message for you today, it's that there is no single uh, solution in isolation. Everything affects everyone else. So all the parts have to be understood by everybody, by all the actors, and all the actions are all going to need to take account of their effect on other parts. So we urge the committee to ensure that the decisions on priorities in particular, on spending, on sequence and action, take Take account of the whole sector and be aware of the, uh, the potential for one to affect the other. We have to remind ourselves also that a house is many things ranging from deeply personal and emotional issues that surround the word home to really practical considerations of the house as a financial asset that involves complex building and planning regulations for instance. Um, we uh, completely uh, adhere to and promote uh, the re reality that shelter is a human right. It's a human right. And while at the same time your address is often a social signal of your status, uh, we uh, draw attention to the fact that the cost of housing is the single biggest factor that determines the consumer price index and therefore is the single biggest driver of wage inflation in Ireland. The house is also the biggest financial deal that most people ever make and that our mortgage or rent repayment are probably our single biggest household payment every month. Month. That means that nobody is neutral about housing. So we have a sector that's full of contradictions. So for instance, the couple who enjoy the increasing value of their home in a rising market will at the same time rue the fact that their children can't afford their own new home. 
The Department of Finance uh, are likely to gain revenue from increases in house prices and house building, while the Department of, Envi of Jobs will view the same increase as lost international competitiveness. All of these factors need to be part of the Committee's considerations in trying to make plans for the future uh, of our housing in Ireland. So, to give a background and to remind ourselves of the context, uh, we need to bear in mind that uh, we're looking at a wide and rapidly changing range of households and their needs in Ireland. The biggest single thing the agency say at every opportunity we get is we be very careful about not carrying over habits of thinking from the past out into the future. The future is going to be dramatically different. Many people, for instance, are very surprised to learn that Irish national home ownership peaked 25 years ago at 80% and it's fallen every year since then. Now, 70% of housing is owner-occupied and 30% is in rental and indeed in Dublin, tenure is now equally divided between ownership and rental. These trends are consistent with international trends. Ireland is becoming a normal European economy. The rental housing consists of both private rental, of which one third receives state support, and social rental housing. Now, these changes can be explained in part because we've gone through significant demographic changes over the last 40 years with a rapid reduction in household size, so that now there's only an average of 2.7 people per household. The reality now is that 75%, three quarters of the housing requirement for the country is for households of three persons or less. And again, all the publications recently of the agency asked people to draw attention to the dramatically different types of houses that we're going to need going out into the future, types of homes, not just the numbers. So it's critical that the work of the committee is based <clears throat> on the need of these new and emerging types of tenure and types of house. We've got to avoid the bitter recent experience of other countries like Spain and Germany, where attempts to recover from housing crisis were stymied by the realisation, which came too late, that they had built houses for sale when the new markets mainly wanted homes built to rent. We mustn't make that mistake. So actions to increase supply must maintain a focus on providing the right types of accommodation while also making house, housing affordable to buy or to rent. Affordability, we're saying to you and to anybody who will listen, is the real challenge. There's no point in us building houses for people, concentrating on supply, if what's supplied can't be afforded. That would be a tragedy. The committee needs to be mindful, as we heard the Minister and, uh, and, and a number of, of your members here this morning, that a third of the population will need to get some level of state support. Now again, to clarify that, that does not mean a third of all housing out into the future is local authority housing. It's that a third of our housing will need some level of support and there are sliding scales of that room. That, that requirement. It's a very nuanced field. We need to ensure that the majority of households can afford housing from their own resources, while also ensuring that the state can provide the necessary supports for that third of the population that require them. So, your committee invited us to identify how the obstacles that are currently impeding progress on housing can be surmounted, as well as the specific actions that need to be taken to achieve urgent implementation of those measures. So in that matter, the Housing Agency wishes to remind the committee of the need to ensure that the right issues are addressed in the right priority. Specifically, that the biggest priority is that because Ireland has no overall plan, priority or focus for housing, there's a very real danger that attention will focus excessively on short-term issues at the expense of long-term progress. And more importantly, we advise that all sections of housing are deeply interconnected. So, for instance, a crisis in market housing, even over an Aylesbury Road, is quickly transferred into pressure on the private rental sector, which, as we've heard this morning, increases pressure on social housing. So solutions to homelessness, for instance, will only emerge when the workings of all of housing is stabilised and improved. The big message for all of us here is that homelessness and rough sleeping, they are the symptoms, and what we need to address are the deep causes that drive people into those circumstances. So addressing the wrong priorities in the wrong sequence will condemn Ireland to an unending process of catch-up and worse to sowing the seeds for the next housing crisis. So for instance, table one of what we've uh, attached shows that the overall number of types of households in Ireland uh, <coughs> indicates that homelessness, for instance, people in emergency accommodation, rough sleeping, account for maybe three to 4,000, 3,400 households, which is the subject of vigorous debate, as we know, while over 200,000 households of our fellow citizens are in mortgage arrears. And on top of that, there's 200,000 homes lying vacant. 
These are really big figures, and we want you to try to make sure that your priorities recognise that. So those examples suggest that while homelessness is indeed an acute problem, our priorities also need to be directed towards issues that affect nearly half a million households and half a million properties. So we've supplied the committee with the material that sets out our opinions on a wide range of issues and how they can be overcome. So we're here to answer questions about that. But before leaving it, just have a look at the table down below which says what the Housing Agency does. We've only been in existence since 2010, and I suppose in some ways we're a standing symptom of what's going on in Ireland in housing, that there's a huge amount of work taking place that many people are unaware of across a very wide issue. So our wonderful uh, Chief Executive here and David are involved in things as wide ranging as repairing the pyrite houses, dealing with large agencies who, are, who have tranches of, of property that are, that, that are being transferred. We've dealt with things like the uh, unfinished estates, as well as supporting the introduction of things like HAP and keeping statistics and uh, trying to carry out research. So it's a huge field, a very, very wide range of activities, and we think that that very wide range of activities is a reason that we're able to share with you the types of advice and opinions that may be of assistance to the committee. We've summarised in a really simple form, which I'm not going to read out, uh, our very high-level description of what we see as being the obstacles, the solutions and the actions. And uh, we're saying the obstacles are not the ones that people are talking about. We're saying it's the lack of an overall plan, the lack of priorities and the lack of focus. We're saying they're the real issues. And that's what we'd like to talk to you about this afternoon, Kirla. Thank you very much, Mr. Skihan. Just one figure you have there, and you might expand it, and then over to the members. Uh, you mentioned that there are 200,000 homes lying vacant. Uh, they would obviously divide up between holiday homes and homes that mightn't be in parts of the country that there's demand for. Have you any idea or any sense amongst that 200,000 what number of those houses would be in high demand areas and what it would take to bring them back into what we might call uh, ordinary everyday use? We've done a few things on that. We, we have provided a very detailed pie chart showing uh, how that breaks down. We've also, in the paper submitted to you, talked at section, and Sir David will be able to tell me, uh, uh, which is a breakdown of the uh, of the vacancies. Uh, it's, uh, there's a note on vacant housing here, which is a, a standalone sheet, and uh, it points out the various different categories within it. So there's an overall vacancy rate of 14%, uh, and uh, then within that, there are, there, we've given the breakdown. There are also figures available, which we will supply uh, the committee subsequently uh, with about uh, locations of where they are, but they exist throughout the country. And uh, they're the single biggest example of the fact that the work of the committee has got to stop yourselves being sucked in to the debate, which is fueled by people who have skin in the game, who tell you the only solution to this is putting one brick on top of another. What sets the agency apart from everybody else is we're saying the construction and management of our existing and uh, new resources are where the solution will, will, will lie. That's what we're saying. We need a plan, a holistic plan, and we've given tables there, for instance, showing how we can meet our targets going out into the future by a blended mix of building and bringing into better use underutilised houses, like we get in our towns and villages, and vacant houses, which we have all over the country. Uh, you might, as you suggested there, submit that to the committee. They just think that we could see that. Okay, it's open to the members, if anybody would like to. Any questions? Deputy Wallace, I can see you're looking yeah, interested. Um, I sort of, I'd be disappointed if we didn't ask him something. Um, wh what do you think we should do uh, to address the fact that housing, private housing is too expensive in Ireland? Well, we all have to acknowledge that. That's the first thing. We all have to put on the table that the word affordability is key to all of our efforts going forward and that that is accepted by everybody, that it's currently too expensive. That's the first thing. The second thing is that housing and the costs of housing are made up of a number of different elements, all of which have to be separately examined, and we hope to bring to the attention of the, of the committee and others work that we're doing to examine how to value engineer the various different components down. We're taking our inspiration from the electronics sector, people like Michael Dell, who brought things like computers down from being 5,000 to 4,000 to 1,000 to 500 uh, euros a, a unit. And we think the same potential exists for the housing sector by examining things like land in the rest of Europe. Uh, land makes up 10 to 15% of the cost of a house. It's many times that in, uh, in Ireland. Uh, elements to do with expectations of profit, uh, the financing of it, the financing of our, of our uh, uh, as I heard you say this morning, the financing of our deals are exorbitant and not affordable by, by many traditional developers. And one of the big issues, and this is a very, very new thing for people to think about in Ireland is scale. 
Now, I, I heard you this morning, uh, Deputy, describe the fact there are many, many fine builders of the small size all over Ireland, but it's, it's, it's a reality that the smaller the scale, the less easy it is to achieve economies of off-site construction, of very large-scale purchasing. So one of the main things we're saying to you as a committee, for public housing and for many other types of housing, is a transition to building at scale, and I'm talking about building in units of 500 at a go, you start to get dramatic uh, decreases in costs of things like labour and mobilisation of skills, skilled labour. So that's, they're the two big things, land and scale, if I want to give you a simple one. Uh, in terms of detail, we've prepared, which I can't see just in front of me at the moment, a table of measures, because again, we've been listening to the questions you've been asking people during the week, and we've identified 12 short and medium term actions, really quick ones, that would increase and accelerate housing provision, and we leave those with you uh, uh, also uh, today. But uh, the, the cost one, uh, you, there's no one, one thing, it's, it's engineering down all of them, but scale is the big one. Scale is the big one. Well, uh, on the issue of scale, um, but would you admit, I, I listen, I realise that it costs a lot more to build 10 houses per unit than to build 100, but we must also take on board the fact that the guy who builds 100 uh, actually wants a higher profit per unit than the guy who's building 10. Uh, would you agree with that? No, no, I don't. Uh, we, the, the, the basic message is that the Marks and Spencers and Tesco's of this world can make huge amounts of money based on a very small percent of profit on each individual one, whereas our small traditional high street grocer is the person who has to charge the high prices, I'm afraid. Scale drives price down like nothing else. Right, you're, you're comparing it to other, other businesses like Marks and Spencer and how that uh, mm -hmm. whole industry works that, that they're involved in. Uh, but. Uh, my experience has been that um, we have a particular problem in Ireland uh, with the profit margin that the larger uh, developer has, uh, has looked for. We obviously have a particular problem uh, with the, uh, the profit that the land banker uh, is looking for. And uh, obviously, as, as you, know, I heard, you might have heard me say this morning, that uh, it's something that we haven't addressed here. Um, but. Uh, I think that we, I, uh, your points are very good, but I think we need to look at the fact that uh, despite the fact that things can be done so much cheaper on scale, um, uh, I think we have to have some sort of control uh, over uh, the type of profits that that large developer uh, is able to commandeer. Yeah, I mean, sorry, nothing that we are saying puts us in opposition. So the uh, expectations of profit are wildly unrealistic among many of the uh, former players in this sector, and that's got to be uh, questioned, and those people will slowly lose their position on the pitch as they realise other people can make money with lower profit margins on, on larger developments. Um, the other part of that, though, are people that you just mentioned, like the land bankers. The land bankers themselves are seeking to recover land costs which were incurred at a period when people were excessively optimistic, to put it charitably. And uh, a lot of people in the sector have to understand that that particular component of the price, the, the land price paid back in 2004, is never going to be repaid. They're never going to get that money back in particular. And that's got, we have to find a way of taking that out of the equation as well. Right, well, uh, I, I would argue that most of the land banking uh, land, I, I'd say over 90% of it, was purchased many years before that, and that the sites that were being bought in 03, 04 uh, were actually being uh, turned over, that they weren't actually being bought to be banked at that mm. time, they were being bought to be developed. Mm. So uh, I, do, I, do, I still do think that, uh, that the, bank, the land banking uh, area is... Uh, is a huge potential for the state to actually um, move in on, uh, but they've got to have. Obviously, we need the will to make that happen. Yeah, I, I, we won't disagree, and yeah. uh, we will submit papers to you to, to build up on that, and not to take the time of the committee. But Deputy Wallace, everything you're saying is correct, but we're just trying to put it in a bigger, a bigger context. Eric, um, just on the, on the issue of scale, and the, the concern I have that um, it's kind of been said by everybody that we can never build the big, big estates again. I don't believe that should be the case, that we should be looking at developing as many